just when you thought it was safe to go on to iTunes. This is Next Level Guy. The only website that makes self-development as fun as going to the movies. It's time to take the red pill and escape the Matrix. Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of the Next Level Guy podcast. Today's guest is Trip Lanier. Trip is the host of the New Man podcast, which is beyond the macho jerk and the new age wimp. His podcast has been listened to millions of times by men all around the world. He coaches entrepreneurs around the world to get out of the shallow end of the pool, redefine success, and align their work with what they were put on this earth to do. Over the years, he's designed several businesses to support a simple lifestyle focused on freedom, ease, and fun. As a host, he's interviewed experts from and authors from all walks of life. But first, Next Level Guy is associated with some great affiliates, offering a wide variety of products to make your life better with some amazing deals. To check out the gadgets, tools, books, etc. I feel would help you reach that next level in your life, please visit www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates. That's www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates for the latest deals, offers and discount codes. And now to the interview with Trip. How do you describe who you are and what you do? Uh, I do two major things. Uh, as a coach, I work with people all around the world, primarily men. These are guys that um, aren't interested in kind of maintaining the status quo. These are guys that uh, are in touch with what they're really on this planet to do, or they've got a sense that there's something more to their life than what they're currently doing. And uh, and so I work with them. And, and kind of the, the what I've noticed in personal development is that there's this sense of we get, we get into personal development. We start asking bigger questions in life. If we engage that path, we suddenly start to outgrow the two most important things in our lives, which is our, our relationships and our, pro, our profession in the world. And so the coaching that I do is, is primarily around, like, how do you continue to grow as a man, create the life that you want, and do so in a way that doesn't destroy your relationships, it doesn't destroy your professions? And, and a lot of the guys that I work with come to me because they actually want to have their professions align with this sense of calling and this sense of passion in the world. And so I help them with that. And then primarily, I'm most known for being the host of the New Man podcast. You can find that on iTunes and Stitcher. Just do a search for the New Man podcast. I've been doing that for almost 10 years now. And um, and that's primarily how most people know me. Yeah, because that's how um, I discovered you. So can you tell me how you got into that? I mean, is this something you've wanted to do as a child or, you know, where about did you grow up and how did you move into the coaching and you know helping guys live the life that they deserve well i was i was one of those guys that needed the help i had um i'd been really fortunate that um you know i graduated from from college and a few months out of college i started my first business i was broke i went into a bunch of debt i turned that into a successful business and was able to fund the lifestyle that i wanted i was able to travel i was a musician i was able to fund you know, my ability to be a musician and, and go have some amazing times. And I learned at an early age that um, we can outgrow things. We can reach a certain level and, and plateau and, and be like, well, is is this all there is? And some guys hit that point in their 50s and 60s. Some guys hit it in their 40s. I, I hit mine in my late 20s. And I went through a, a big period of, you know, what am I really here to do? Is there is there more to this than just making money and you know trying to just fit in with what whatever thing else that's going on and and um and so i i just i became voracious about personal development and spiritual development and um and then loved having conversations about that i'd rather have those conversations than let's say sports or some i'd like to talk about sports but there was i just loved having conversations that had real meaning and had real depth and and i liked looking at our lives as you know, a, a blank canvas. Like, what are we here to create? Um, as a creative person, I like to, to apply those those creative skills to our to our lives and and uh, and look at it like, hey, we don't know have to, we don't have to just stick with the convention. We don't have to do what everybody else is doing. We have this once in a lifetime shot. So, what do you really want to do with that? And and that's where I got plugged in as a coach and and realized that I could be paid well to have conversations i love to have with people that are really leaning into their lives and creating something meaningful and and um, that's how i got into coaching because that's how i discovered you i was looking you know for more i knew that there was people out there who were 
just fed up with the same old thing and they were going after what they wanted and I just didn't know how to do it. And I can still remember the day I found your podcast and it was just that you had such a calming, soothing voice and, uh. you know, it's like about the macho and the wimp, you know, and it was like you just went straight into it and it was like you were listening to what I was thinking in my head and mm. just answering these questions and... I mean, your podcast is absolutely brilliant. So could you go and tell a little bit about what the new man principle is in your podcast? Well, I would say that the new man is essentially an integrated man. And what that really means is he's not just a guy that's a brainiac that looks at his uh, life through the lens of just what he can touch and think. And it's all about ideas and theory. He actually has an emotional world. He's in touch with what he, what he feels. He's in touch with what he cares about. Um, he's got heart. And he's also got balls. He's got uh, a sexual drive. He's here to penetrate the world. He's here to really create something and move through the world powerfully. And he's also here to, to create amazing relationships. So I see, I see combinations of those aspects in men where they can be very smart, very intellectual, and they can also have a real drive in the world, but they suck at the relationship thing. They can't really quite put it together when it comes to making relationships. There's guys that are have big hearts and they're very loving and, and, but they just can't seem to put it together when it comes to creating something in their lives. They, their, their careers are falling apart. So there's, there's some, you know, most of us are, are struggling with one or two of those aspects. And so the new man is not any one guy in particular, nor is he some ideal that we all aspire to. It's going to be different for every guy, for every guy listening out there. There's a different version of, of, of his potential or his optimal self. And, um, it's really just about kind of clearing a lot of the shit that we learn growing up, getting that stuff out of the way so that, so that we can just unfold and become that guy. And we'll learn some skills along the way, but uh, a lot, I believe a lot of it's already just written in us, and it's about getting out of the way of who we think we should we, who, who we should be or who we're supposed to be. Let go of that stuff, and, and do we have the guts to really become who we, we are essentially? Yeah, because I think that's uh, a big problem is we, we don't know what we're meant to be. You know, we think we have to be like everybody else and we have to be like these guys on the TV, etc. Um, how do you define what masculinity is, you know, with yourself, with your clients? You know, is there a way that you could help people figure out what it means to be a man in today's society? You know, I, I, I stay away from this con this part of the conversation, especially around masculinity. And, and I, it's not that I have a, a, a thing against it. I mean, but what I've found is that Typically, there's a lot of guys that have been domesticated throughout their early life. They, they, they've been told how to be. They've been told who they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to act. And then they, get to a, they start to realize that they got neutered along the way and that they missed out on this masculinity piece. They missed out on what it means to be able to set a boundary, to be able to take care of themselves, to be able to take lead, take charge. So then they start to say, well, now tell me how to be masculine. Show me the, the masculine ideal and what I've found is that instead of listening to themselves and learning how to develop their own sense of authority, they just go and trade their old form of domestication for a new form of domestication. And, and there's plenty of guys out there that want to teach you this ideal of masculinity. So I tend to stay away from that. I like to come back to what does it mean for you to be a whole person? What does it mean for you to be an integrated person? Because you might find if you're willing to let go of the, of the expectations and the conditions that we place on ourselves, you might not be a very masculine person. You might, you, at, an, at an essential level, you may be more of a feminine person. I'd rather you be more of who you truly are than try to fit into this, you know, the next box of what it means to be a masculine thing. So I, I tend to stay away from that, and I, I just use terms like, who are you really? What do you want most in this lifetime? Let's let's go create that. And then that challenge right there is going to lay out the, the path for you to become more of who you are. That's a great answer because that was what I struggled with. You know, it was the fact that you weren't a guy if you didn't go out and shag around. You weren't a guy if you didn't go out and get blazing drunk every night. And I just found that complete BS. I mean, and unfortunately, too many guys are, def you know, that's their life even if they don't want it they think they have some sort of ideal to, man to live up to so in your opinion is that the criteria for being regarded as a successful man is fulfilling you know completing that sort of three areas of your life that sort of spiritual emotional and physical or so how would you define a successful man 
I think it's I think it's up to the man to define what success means for himself. You know, so if I'm working with a client that I'm, we're always coming back to what do you want? If he comes to me and he says, "Look, I I want to be this guy. I want to be I want to be a combination of this guy or that guy." I, I know we're off track because he's using some kind of an external uh, yardstick, so to speak. And most of the time, the real challenge for us is to get in touch with who we are and actually pay attention to ourselves and say, "Where do I feel most alive?" Where do I feel most expansive? Where do I feel really strong? And we can find that if we pay attention to that information, it's going to lead us into uncertainty. It's probably going to lead us away from this ideal that we have in our head about how we're supposed to act. And so I don't use the word success a lot um, it's just because it, it paints some picture that somehow your life needs to be m- much drastically different than where you are or, or that something's missing. A lot of times, like I said, it's more like archaeology. It's about getting rid of things. It's about letting go of stuff, letting go of limiting ideas and beliefs, and then living from the place that's, that's still there, that's most essential. So from all the sort of, you've interviewed some amazing people on your podcast, um, can you just go into some of the people you've interviewed and, you know, what sort of advice sort of sticks out to you most, you know, is there, say, three things that have always stood by you every time you've done a podcast? I think that there's um, – I've always tried to find guys that were embodying this for themselves, you know, the things that we're, that you and I are talking about here today, and, and they're usually quite different. So I've had musicians and artists, rock stars on the show. I've had Zen masters on the show. I've had, you know, these super high achiever type guys on the show. I've had, uh, you know, Navy SEALs on the show. So – it doesn't, you know, and then I've just had guys that were just guys and they went and did something pretty extraordinary. They're the guy that lives next door to you and you don't realize that he did something extraordinary with his life. So I'm always interested in those stories. It's one thing when we hear about a Tim Ferriss or a Mark Devine or, um, you know, one of these best selling authors that comes out with these, these books and these ideas. We have a tendency to put people like that on a, on a pedestal and remove ourselves of the personal responsibility that comes with it. Like, oh, well, this guy says that, and that's great, and I can try to integrate some of that into my life, but not necessarily going to really hold myself. You know, we don't don't see ourselves as one of those guys. We create this thing. He's one of those guys. I like to bring guys on the show that are just like you and me, that have been through some kind of uh, adversity and then come out the other side. Because when that guy comes on the show and he shares his story – there's a part of us, if we're listening, if we're on the treadmill or we're on the bus or we're, we're on our way into work and we're listening to that story, there's a part of us that goes, holy shit, that, that guy did that. I could do that too. And I find that that's far more powerful. It's far more powerful when we see ourselves in that guest and we recognize that there's, a, there's another possibility for ourselves. So I love finding those stories, A, because it wakes me up, but B, because I know it's going to wake up the guys that are listening. And is there any ones that sort of start to stick out in your mind just now? Is there ones that you could re- recommend for people to have a listen to? Um, you know, there was a powerful story on. I had a guy, a, a, a coach that I know, came on the program. He'd been through um, God, just an amazing life. He he he. Uh, in his teen years, he was very confused. I think he got into drugs and went down went down a really dark path with that as a, as an addict. Um, Clean himself up. He, he, as part of that lifestyle, he went into the gay community and and um, and then cleaned up his lifestyle and then pretended he wasn't gay anymore. Started a family, um, had two boys, and then uh, realized after I don't know how many years of marriage that he didn't want to go through that anymore. He decided to let go of the marriage, and then it was time for him to actually come to grips with that. He was a homosexual, and uh, and so his big fear was telling his sons, his two sons. Um, that he was a homosexual and he was terrified. And I think that even if, you know, most of us are going to have a hard time relating to that story, for one, but number two, we can relate to it because there's a thing in us that if, if we felt like if the people around us knew this thing about us, they, we, they'd leave us. They'd be terrified of that. And um, I just remember doing that story, sharing that guy's story, and having so many people just be like, man, if that guy could have that conversation with his sons and have his sons come out the other side, like, no big deal, dad. Like, we're still here. Like, everything's great. Like, it just was a huge weight that lifted off of this guy's shoulders and, and opened up such a, a, a new realm of possibility. Well, that, that kind of stuff, like just being willing to be honest with ourselves and being honest with the people around us, 
opens up so much about opens up so much more possible for us. So many of us are living in a tiny little box because we think that that's how we have to live in order to be loved and accepted. Um, and it's just not true. So that, that was the first story. And there's been so many, but that was the first story that jumped out when you asked me the question. That's amazing. It's, you know, to think that somebody could have that conversation and, it, you know, to raise two great sons like that who can be accepting. And, you know, I think sometimes that's our biggest fear is that things are going to be worse than they actually ever are going to be. You know, we build up this idea of fear and, you know, forms of a fail, forms of a reject, etc. Um, can you go a little... Well, I was just going to... Let me add to that. And how many guys then talk about what strength is, talk about what it means to be strong, and then shy away from the facts, shy away from the truth. And so I, I, if we're going to really talk about strength, if we're going to really talk about power, which is what most of us are drawn to as masculinity... As, as masculine people, then we're going to go down that road. But I want to show what real strength and what real, real power looks like. And it's being willing to not kick the can down the road year after year after year and numb yourself from that truth. It's being willing to bring it into the light. And uh, that to me is real, real power. That's, that's real strength. And have you had, uh, like, is it an example of a reader transformation of somebody, you know, accepting that power or bringing the sort of, the light into the darkness, so to speak. You know, um, have you maybe got a personal tale, or is it a reader transformation that really sticks with you? Uh, there's been so many. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of where to begin. You know, as a, as a coach, I hear these these stories uh, all the time. Whether it's it's professional, it's it's guys that have reached some. They think it's the end of the road. Whether it's with their their marriage or their profession, and then they turn around and. And over the course of, the, of our work together, they, they end up in a better spot than they were in before. And so I, you know, that's that's the beautiful part of this transformation uh, work is is being able to see those types of things. Because uh, just from doing some research and you know looking at the comments on your your videos and stuff like that, you know, I couldn't find anything negative. It was always about how your videos and your podcast really kind of just spoke to the person and it, it let them better their lives you know and if i th if i can think i've helped one person with doing this to me that's mind-blowing but just to see the love and the the help that you've given people it must be an amazing feeling so say somebody's listening to this right now they're dealing with some some shit shall we say how would you start you know is there a way that they can start betting their lives right now the first piece is to take full responsibility for it it's as long as we're in a state where we think that other people or something outside of us is is going to be the thing that makes it better, that's when we're screwed. Um, so, yeah, something bad or something unfortunate may have happened to you, uh, and that sucks. I, I don't want to discount that. But ultimately, there, there comes a threshold to cross where we recognize, okay, well, what's within my responsibility? What, what can I choose? How can I choose to respond to this? And up until that point, that person is not really going to change. That person's really not going to lean into the process. Um, they're going to seek a, uh, a solution outside of themselves. It's going to be somebody else that's going to take care of it. The next thing that comes along is going to fix them or somebody, you know, they're, it's a, they're, they're waiting for a rescuer or a hero, whether it's the, in the, you know, some kind of uh, ideology or it's the government or who knows. But if you're if you're if you're depending on somebody else to change in order for you to be better in order for your life to be better, that's a recipe for disaster. So that first piece is like, okay, things suck. I'm not happy about how things are. I'm not even. It's not even about who's to blame. So what can I do about it now? What's within my power? And a lot of times we just got to recognize, okay, there's something for me to learn here. There's a, there's a new skill for me to learn. Um, there are resources for me to create, whether that's time or creating space for for more things to be done or or, or even go, to go create some more money so that you can go do X, Y, Z. Um, and then a lot of times it's, it's giving ourselves permission to just step into that growth. If we're surrounded by people that aren't motivated, if, if we're surrounded by people who are negative and pessimistic and, and don't see themselves as, um, as uh, proactive, then we'll tend to kind of hang out at that level with them. So a big part that I've found that even if, if guys have the resources and even if the guys have um, the ability to learn things, a lot of times they haven't given themselves permission to be the one that says, you know what, I'm going to lean in. I'm actually going to make this shift in my life. Um, I, you'd be surprised at how many times I, I run into that limitation where they say, I'm just not that guy. 
I'm not the guy. I'm not that guy that goes and does X, Y, Z in his life. And if they're willing to let go of that identity, then anything is possible. They say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to create the time. I'm going to create the energy. I'm going to go learn this new thing. And I want this. I, I, I'm, I'm able to have this in my life. If they're willing to make that, those three choices there, uh, then anything's possible. I'll coach that guy. Because that's something um, Brent Smith, a dating coach, once said to me was that you just change your story. You know, there's too many people get wrapped up into the identity of I'm Ian, I do this, I do X, Y, Z. But, you know, mm. They tell themselves so much that they believe it, like it's core values. So rather than just going, oh, I don't want to do that anymore, so I'm not going to do it. You know, they won't change their story. It's like part of their identity. Um, right. And... You know, what, is that what you think is the biggest problem the majority of your clients face is not wanting to take the responsibility for themselves, for their own actions? You know, I actually won't coach people if they haven't gotten to that point. That's, that's like they got to get over that before I'll even start working with them. So um, but, yeah, when I first started out coaching, the people that were the most difficult to coach, the ones that were like their feet were in concrete, essentially, were the ones that just couldn't get over themselves, that couldn't get out of this thing. They wanted change in their lives. They wanted their lives to be different, but they actually didn't want to change. They didn't see that it was going to require them to change on some level. And so, of course, it was a, it was a battle for them. That must have been a painstaking time because, you know, you give great advice and for people who aren't willing to listen. You know, it, it must be so infuriating. Um, something I struggled with from myself was when I first started like the podcast, the website, it was seen as strange by a lot of my friends and too many of them, you know, they just didn't understand it. So it's like the fear of the unknown. Like I, mm. I was seen as the sad one for wanting to better my life, not sit in the path <laughs> every day. It was a, It's a strange mentality. So for those people who are wanting to improve and better their lives, how do you deal with trolls and people who are you know trying to bring you back down you know that story about the crabs if they're all trying to escape the bucket they'll pull other crabs back in rather than trying yeah. to get themselves out so how do we deal with you know those people who are always going to be negative and bring you down and try to keep you in that little box i, I think the first thing is to recognize that they can only do that if you allow them like everybody's going to have their opinion and everybody's got their their perspective and it would make sense that if you if you were to step into their mind and you would look at what you're doing based on their perspective, you'd probably look at yourself and be like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense either. They're just not going to get it. So it's not about trying to get other people to see things as the way that you do. I don't, I don't, there's, I'm not a big, I don't think we need to be evangelists or trying to convince or convert people. When people want to change, then they'll go look. We have a huge search engine that will find you basically anything in the world. World. So when you're ready to learn that thing, it's there for you. Um, so I just, I, you know, if somebody's trolling or, or they're in that place, and I think this is more relevant to if, I'm, if I identify with a certain group of people and I recognize that I'm outgrowing that group or I'm changing from that group, then I'm going to feel the pull to want to stay into that. I'm going to feel the pull to want to domesticate myself or conform, uh, contort myself to stay in that group. And it, it can be really painful when we realize that we're changing and outgrowing things. And so I... I Resist the temptation to villainize, to make the other people bad, right? Resist the temptation to be like, oh, they're just not this, or they don't read these books, they don't do this. And it's like, that's just, that's just their choice. Um, and then whatever comments they may have, they can sting, but ultimately they can't do anything to keep you from growing. They can't do anything to keep you from becoming who you want to become. And I think that that's the most powerful thing is just recognizing, as Don Miguel Ruiz says, you know, it's one of the four agreements. We don't, we don't have to take things personally. It's a lot easier said than done, but I think it gives us a lot of freedom when, when we recognize it, we don't have to. It's just a choice. It's a choice to take things personally. I mean, it's, you, it sounds like you've seen my history. I was very much like that. You know, I was outgrowing friends, and I was sort of seeing them as the bad people, you know, the ones who didn't get it and who were making fun of it. And, you know, I sort of villainized them rather than just them being on the level that they were happy with. You know, I was wanting to be on another level. I was wanting to try new things and grow. Um, so if you are sort of outgrowing friends or you're wanting to make new friends, you know, it's, re it's a really difficult thing to do it as you sort of get older. How, mm. c how can, you know, your clients, guys listening to this, how can they make friends with 
people doing the things they want to do. I, you know, this is a big challenge for me. I'm in my, uh, I guess I'm getting in my mid forties now and I've got a family and we moved to a new area just a few years ago. And, and I, this is the challenge for me. My community is now spread out all over the country, uh, sometimes even the world. So, um, I, I, this is a challenge for me. Like I've got a few of my buddies. We make a point to get together a few times a year. We go surf together. We go hang out on the beach, whatever we're going to do. Um, we have to work at it. That's, that's the, that's the first part. But then I've noticed that even in my, the new area where we live, finding people to hang out with, um, it's, uh, it's a real challenge. And, um, and so, uh, I, I, it really just comes back to, we've got to be active. You can't be holed up in your house. Uh, stuck on your phone and trying to make friends, you know, and, and expecting to make friends in that way. It's, it's, it's go out and do the things that you love to do. Um, even if it has nothing to do with personal development or this and that, like just get out there in the world and, and start doing the things that you want to do and, and, and put yourself in situations where you're going to bump into those other people. And that's a vulnerable place. That's a scary place. That's where we can get rejected. It's where it's uncomfortable. There's those, those awkward kind of like, Hey, how you doing? I'm so-and-so. What do you do? Oh, what do you do? Like that, that kind of small talk stuff can get really awkward at times. It is for me. Um, so, uh, but you got to do it. If you want a community, you got to get out there and, and, and swing at it. So, um, I can definitely relate to this question. It's really challenging and it just takes perseverance to get out there and interact with people. Good. It takes time to build friendships man. it takes years. It takes years of, of, of accumulated experiences to really build those relationships. Cause that's something I've struggled with as well. You know, I moved, yeah. I moved to a new uh, city about five hours away from where I grew up just, you know, to get these kind of opportunities. And it's something I've struggled with. You know, I've had to make friends through the gym and, you know, going to the cinema and things like that. But it's very sort of clicky kind of friends, you know. They don't, mm. they don't interact in that kind of altogether. It's, it's a weird one. Um, but perseverance is something that I'm, I'm going through myself, so I can appreciate your pain. Um, you know, one thing I appreciate about my wife, I'm more of a, we're both pretty introverted, but there, you know, we've moved several places in the country since we've been together. And, and she typically, every time we move somewhere, she throws a party. She doesn't wait to be invited to anything. She's the one that throws a party and invites the people that are around us to that. And so, um, that's another way. Like a lot of us are kind of waiting, like, huh, oh, come, nobody's inviting me to this and nobody's inviting me to that. Well, be the one that invites people. Put something up on Facebook or, or whatever. Just, just go walk door to door and put some invitations in there in the, in the mailbox. Um, but what happens, I love that stance, though. Like, I'm the one that creates the community. I'm not waiting for somebody to invite me into something. Uh, what if you were the one that created that? And, and so that's, a, that's always challenging for me. And like, oh, what am I doing? I'm typically sitting around waiting for an opportunity to show up instead of being the one to go out and create it. Um, I mean, I've seen um, pictures that you have on your website. You have an absolutely beautiful family. You know, you've uh, got a young daughter. How's fatherhood changed you? You know, how has it changed how you view life and what you do and coaching and things like that? You know, has it opened up your eyes to different ways of looking at life as such? Oh, yeah. I don't even know if I can really appreciate that because it's... (laughs) It's been, I've been a dad now for seven plus years. So, um, gosh, how's it changed me? I, I think just becoming a father and being really close to my family, there's, there's much more of a sense of we instead of I. So I'm, I'm still very much a selfish jerk. <laughs> I'm sure my, my, my wife would argue. Um, but, you know, the big decisions are the things that I'm creating in my life. It runs through a filter of we. Like it, it's not just how's this going to impact me. It's, How's this going to impact my wife? How's this going to impact my daughter? And that's where things can get complicated. Um, but uh, I would say that it, that's that's probably the biggest thing, and just how I go about making decisions. Um, you know, when I was younger, I just I did a lot of stuff. I did whatever I wanted. To just go to the airport, jump on a plane, and go places. I, I I gave myself a lot more of a of a a, a lot more freedom back then. I don't do I don't have that much uh kind of spontaneity as much anymore. It's a little more challenging for me to get get going and do things outside of my family. So um and it's one of the challenges I have is like I want to make sure I don't get too sedentary. I want to make sure I don't get too kind of fossilized uh in just family mode, which is one of the reasons why I love having my group of friends and and we jump on planes and go hang out together. It's it, I always come back a better guy. My my wife's always grateful to meet that guy of who I am when I come off the plane. 
because that was a quote that I absolutely loved. You know, that you said one of the best feelings in the world was when your wife took your daughter in in the morning and she's beating on your chest and punching you in the beans. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> it's strange that you enjoy things like that. Um, my sister's had three little kids and mm. being an uncle has been life changing for me. It's really made me want to be a better person just for them as much as for me. Um, mm. I can't imagine what it's like being a parent. I like being able to hand them back when you're playing with them. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah. They're, 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 yeah. That's part of the we thing, right? Like you recognize, oh, somebody's watching me. I, I'm, I'm setting an example, and um, yeah, there's just it, it's it's a whole different perspective on our lives, and and I couldn't imagine trying to go back and you know tell my 27 year old self these kind of lessons. You just, I just wouldn't be able to hear it back then. You know, but now I, I, I'm like, oh, man, now I get so many of the things that, that I was reading back then and I can have a different appreciation for them now. And have you got advice for people who are new fathers or people who are getting towards that stage of life? You know, how would they develop to be ready for that kind of thing? Or is it just a case of just go through it? I don't I, yeah, I don't know if you get to be ready. I, I think that, you know, I think that there's just going to it's going to always be challenging um, but it's also just amazing. I, you know, I was one of those, my wife and I had been married for several years and we're kind of waiting and quote until we were quote ready to start our family. And we really thought there was going to be this opportune time. And suddenly there'd be a letter in the mail saying, you, okay, you can start a family now. And, um, I'm glad that we just charged it and went for it. Um, you know, when you're thinking about, am I going to have a kid or not? You don't really understand who that kid is. And now, now that I have my daughter and it's, it's my daughter and I know who this person is, I can't imagine my life without her. So it's, um, it's just one of those things. All the cliches are true and they're true for a reason. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just it, what I've noticed about becoming a parent for me is it's just, it's height. It's made the highs higher. It's made the lows more intense. Um, it's just really, my whole life experience is way broader now and and i'm I'm grateful for that I, i'm a much better man i believe because i'm a father I, I definitely uh watch my step a lot more now that i'm a father and how do you juggle you know running a business doing the podcast i've seen you started doing some amazing youtube videos right how do you juggle that with being a father and being the role model and you know you're because you seem to be everywhere so how do you avoid like burnout and stuff like that and how do you make like family time do you have strategies that you implement Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I, you know, my life is by design. So if I'm working with somebody, we start with, you know, if you were to answer, you know, talk about what success is. Well, for me, it's more about space. It's more that where, how much time am I putting towards this? How much time do I have for that? So I, I take a week off every month. I only work basically three days a week coaching. Um, the things that if I'm, if you see me or hear me on the internet or something, it's because I'm doing something I'm enjoying that's energizing for me. So there's very little that I have in my life and there's, there's stuff, but there's very little that I have. That's like the, the drudging, like, uh, I gotta do this. And you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, I have people that I hire to take care of certain things, but it's been by design. And there, there were, there were years where it was really freaking hard because I had to, I had to get it, get it through the, 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 uh, the, the dip there, so to speak. But, um, you know, my life these days is by design. Um, and so it's not an accident. I'm not waiting. I'm not hoping that, gosh, if I just put my head down and someday it's all going to work out. It was always by design. I'm going to get to this place where I have this much time off that I'm going to be putting my energy and efforts towards the things that are energizing for me. And then it's always a bit of a, uh, of a, of a steering act. It's, it's, it's not set it and forget it. I think that's a hard thing for guys. We just really want to find some finish line so we can kick up, or, you know, put our feet up on the table and crack a beer and watch the TV and forget about shit. And um, it's it's staying vigilant. Like, okay, where am I energized now? And, and honoring when we need to have space. So I appreciate that you think I'm everywhere, but I actually have a really spacious lifestyle, a really spacious <laughs> works. It feels that way because I, I, a lot of what I'm doing is very playful. I, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. I, and I, I, it's like I said, it's not an accident. I've worked really hard to set that up and put that into play. <laughs> so how, how did you prepare for, you know, like making these changes and things like that? How can somebody overcome that fear of going for it? You know, how can somebody just get out the shadows and go for what they want? You know, is there routines? Do you believe in things like meditation, mantras, or is it just 
go for it and make mistakes or well i i mean the answer is yes to a lot of that i mean i've been a meditator for well over almost 15 years now i meditate every day uh mostly every day um but that's primarily just to kind of keep my brain in shape to, to you know the meditation's got a lot of benefits but for me that i really recognize is that there's this wrestling match between my more rational reasonable side of my brain and and then this kind of animal fear-based side of my brain and so i've just i've just you know my job is to listen my job is to really pay attention and uh meditation just keeps me sharp uh on that end um and then in terms of going for it i think a lot of us have this this belief that we're always on the edge of some cliff and that we've got to make some big leap and it can certainly feel that way sometimes but what i've found is more true is life is or whatever project we're doing is just a series of it's a long walk you know it's it's one step after the other it's not just one big step it might feel like that first step is a big step but a lot of times it's just all right get up and let's do some more walking today and then next week we're going to keep walking some more and so what i've found is that just start taking that that's what's the smallest step you can start to take and a lot of people are like no well shouldn't it be more dramatic shouldn't it be bigger and um, it's like, no, it's usually pretty mundane. It's, it's a phone call. It's a, it's writing this letter. It's asking for this. It's taking this course. And people are like, Oh, well, I, I thought it was going to be some big, huge thing. Like you'd write a movie about, and it just doesn't work that way. So, um, real change, real transformation is, is far more about that foot, that one foot in front of the other on a consistent basis over a long period of time than some kind of eureka moment where everything changes. It might seem like that you know, there might be moments like that along the way, but they're usually on the end of a lot of that kind of walking, a lot of that, that step-by-step stuff. Um, and then in terms of like, what will people think about me? And that's, that's usually what we've talked about that today is like, Oh my gosh, well, if I decided to do this, what will people think about me? I'd like to remind them about pop stars. Go look at people in, in our pop culture and then look at how hard they work to get attention. Look at the money that is spent. Look at the stupid outfits they wear. Look at the, the, the dumb stories that people write about them just to stay in the limelight. It's like most of the time, the thing you think you're going to do that's going to be this huge, you know, create this huge wave in the world, most people don't, just don't give a shit about. They don't care. Um, and so I found that whenever, you know, these kind of things like, okay, I'm going to go for this um, and it's going to be this huge thing, they, they kind of come back to me and say, it didn't, the other people didn't really care. <laughs> like that happens a lot like not that big a deal. Um, and so I like to just say, look, you know, you got to have to work really hard to get people to care about this stuff. So um, that's probably more true than, than the other thing. Well, think about like the guy I was telling you about that I interviewed, right? Where he came out to his sons, came out of the closet to his sons and his sons were like, okay, you know, all right. I mean, he thought it was going to be this huge uproar and it just, it wasn't as big a deal as what he thought, you know, the impact wasn't as big as what he thought it was going to be. So um, what if that was true for you, the listener, the, the guy that's out there listening right now, the thing that you're holding back from you think is going to be some huge deal. What if it's just not going to be that big a deal? What if nobody really cares? How, how many years are you going to waste avoiding that um, because you thought it was going to be some big deal? And what if it wasn't? Cause you, Would you start today? They forget that, don't they? they? You immediately look at the end goal, which may seem impossible to reach, but nobody ever became a famous say golfer by going straight in and playing in the nationals they have to go practice and gradually go fail come back but you know yeah i think we forget that you know we we look at the end goal rather than the journey and it's like you're saying it's that first step yeah it may be hard but if you keep walking mm. you're going to get to where you want to be um so how does somebody get over that you know is there something that you could recommend to somebody just now that they're wanting to do it do you, they just go for it or yeah yeah take action go I, i'm a huge proponent of like go get data go get experience I, I was talking to a client the other day he's at this place where he just basically wrapped up um his first career and he has a bunch of money in the bank and and people are looking at him like man what a great thing he's like yeah i always fantasized about being in this place right you think this is where you'd want to be he's terrified he doesn't know what to do with his life now he's, he's got all these options and he doesn't know where to go. And it's, and it's actually a very unpleasant experience for him. Of course, he went and had some fun for a while, but now he's just like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I hope it, he's like, I hope nobody asks me, you know, what I'm up to these days because I don't want to answer. I don't know. So he's in this place where he's speculating about what he should do. He's speculating about what the experience might be like. And I just, I don't, I don't trust speculation. 
I'm like, go try, go spend six months in this thing. Go, go actually learn this thing for a year. Go through the dip of learning because a lot of times learning something can suck. It won't be enjoyable, but once you learn how to do it, it can be really enjoyable. Think about learning to swim. Learning to swim is not very fun, but swimming is. Learning how to ride a bike, you're falling down, not really fun. Riding a bike can be fun. So you can't figure this stuff out by sitting on the sidelines and speculating about what you may like. It's about rolling up your sleeves, being willing to put in the time and energy and go try some things and actually see how you feel. Um, most of the time, we want to be able to say on a egoic level, like, oh, look at me. I'm this guy. I have this. I like this image. So I'll go do that. But a lot of times that image doesn't align with what our experience. The experience may be shit. It may not be fun at all. We may not like the pressure or uh, it doesn't make us happy. We hate the work, but, you know, we signed up for this image. So I like to separate those two things. There's the image and then there's also the, the experience. Go find where you're actually lit up. Go, and you can only do that by, by, by doing it, by taking action and getting in there. Uh, so I'm a huge proponent. Like, what can we experiment with? Let's go try. And is that the, the biggest challenge you face for your clients, just getting them started? Or do you get like, um, do you see a typical level of, is it like jealousy or is it um, alcohol abuse? Or is there something that you kind of see in a standard client if there is such a thing? No, I, I won't work with, uh, you know, if, if um, you know, addictions are a part of that's outside of my scope. Um, but a lot of times, you know, with the guys that I work with, I always test them before we'll really work together. I, I, um, I test them. We'll, we'll go take action. You know, what if we never talk together, if we never talk again, what's the, what's the one thing you could do this week that would, that would be a step in this direction? What's the thing you've been waiting to do? I like to have them get that out of the way first before we even start to work together. Cause like I said, our work together is going to be about the transformation over the long haul. It's not just one meeting. It's not about the time that we spend talking together. It's what you do in between those calls. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure you take action. I want to make sure that you're the guy that does what you say you're going to do. That's where the real value of our relationship is going to come from. So I, I like to throw it out there and just see if they'll go take action first. And if they don't, then, you know, call me when you're ready to take action. And are you, do you like the idea of like a responsibility person? So, you know, you see these people who have a deal with a friend that if I don't lose 30 pounds in a month, I will, you know, I give you a check for 200 pounds that you go and cash and give to a charity who I hate or, you know, there's the motivation or do you think it has to come internally to, to maintain that? You know, I found it much easier that if I don't play this kind of nanny role, um, it's going to just going to be up to them. Are they going to, are they willing to live another life in this pattern? And if so, then let's not work together. Yeah, Cause that's, if, if, sorry, what I was just going to say, like if, 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 if they're really going to make a change, then things are a lot easier. I, I found that, that, that there's a commitment level and, and, and I just prefer to work with the people that are like, I'm doing this no matter what, whether I work with you or not, I'm, I'm going to do this. Then that, that's far more enjoyable for me if they're depending on me to be like their trainer and yell at them and, you know, bel belittle them or whatever I got to do to get them in action. Uh, I, I just, I, that's not a role I like to play. So how does somebody develop that internal mental drive, that power? Cause it's something I struggled with. I mean, I um, had a bad breakup first love and it affected me for years and in some way it probably still does. Um, how can people get rid of that negativity that, you know, how do you get the bad thing out of your life to do the thing that you want? Well, sometimes it's appropriate to see a therapist. It's, some, it's appropriate to see somebody whose work is in that, that, you know, that's where they specialize that. So if somebody's, um, you know, I like to look at coaching in a, in a versus therapy in a, like in an athletic sense. So if I'm out on the field and I'm on the field and I get injured, I go see a therapist um, to essentially help me get back on the field, right? Help me rehab this so I can get back on the field. So if that's happening for me in my life, I go through a breakup or I, I've had a loss of some sort or something, something's really given me a shot and I'm struggling. Like I'm just struggling to show up every day, then go get some help, right? There's professionals for that. Um, if you really care about your life and you really care about performing well, then do whatever you got to do so that you can get back to your baseline um, and there are professionals, like I said, that can help you get to, get back there. Now, for coaching, now you're on the you're on the field, you're doing well. You might have been knocked around, you might have a few injuries, but it, now it's about how do you perform at a, at a top level. 
how do you perform it? How do you really squeeze the most out of what you got and, and enjoy it the most as much as you can? That's where I come in. That's that's the kind of work that I do. So it's it's common for for guys that when when we're doing this work because we go in so much into their psychology that we're going to un- uncover some things and 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 it's very common for me to say, hey, you know, let's press pause, go work on this thing, let's get you back in shape so that we can we can put all of your resources towards the thing that we're creating instead of helping you try to avoid this thing that's going on. Yeah, and it's it's quite remarkable how we allow these bad things to become part of our own lives. You know, we don't look to try to get rid of it. We identify with the hurt and the pain and the misery. Um, it's it's an unfortunate thing, and people use drink and drugs, and it's a sort of perpetuating cycle. Um, so, how do you how do you start with a client? You know, say if somebody's interested with working with you right now, how can somebody find out more about your coaching and things like that? Uh, the easiest way is to go to um, triplanier dot com t r i p p l a n i e r dot com. I've also created some audio books and some ebooks that really go into how I work with people and I tell stories in there. And you can get those audio books and ebooks at thenewmanpodcast.com. Um, I recommend just starting there. And most people that read those get a ton of value and then they're good. And then the people that want to work with me see the call like, okay, I want to go more. I actually want to work with Trip. And then they can contact me after that. Because it's like you're saying, you know, you're never going to win from the sidelines. So to actually to do it, you've got to play, you know you've got to win the game. You've got to be in the game. So you've actually got to take the action, and it'll actually show you who's willing to change because they're willing to take the action, like you were saying at the start. You know, um, so we're moving into the area where I like to find out more about the guest. Um, so this is just the sort of fast break questions. Um, I'll okay. throw out some prompts, and you just throw back whatever comes into your head. So, for example, what's your favorite film? Oh, gosh, probably Godfather 2. Good choice. Oh, but you know what? I also love the, you know, I think if I'm going to put on a film, though, I love Tropic Thunder. I just just laughed my ass off in that. It was a good one. I don't know if I've seen that one, actually. Who's in it? Ben Stiller, Jack Black. That's uh, Robert Downey Jr. Oh, the... amazing. uh, The Take Mick of... uh, The War... The war film, yeah. All right, I've got to go check that out. Um, who's oh, yeah. your favorite book? Favorite book? Oh my gosh! I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, Return to Love. I, that, that's a good one for me. But um, gosh, I, just, I have to pass on that one. I just had so many. It's like whatever the one I'm reading now is like. Oh my god, this is the best one. I'm always, you know. <laughs> it's crazy about it. Like my mom, she's like, I can't. Yeah. She only focuses on the one that she's reading just now. Her favorite gadget is the, you know, the Kindle. Just uh-huh. like, the best thing since sliced bread. So yeah, but I do like a good Lee Child book. The, the, the Jack Reacher books are good. The movies weren't that great, but I, I do. You know, if I'm relaxing, I enjoy a good uh, Jack Reacher uh, book by uh, Lee Child. I like Jack Reacher. Uh, your favorite podcast that's not your own. Oh, you know what? Here's where you, here's where I let let it out. I don't I don't listen to podcasts. Um, there were I I think I enjoyed Mark Maron's podcast for a while just because I really liked hearing how creative people did their thing. And while you're, how do you relax away from this? Is it just family time, or have you got a guilty pleasure that you can admit to? Oh, I don't know if there's they're guilty pleasures, but um, I enjoy making music. I spend a lot of time recording. Uh, and creating music in my studio, and I surf. So winter, it's winter time here, so I'm not getting uh, much time in the water. Um, but I, I, I like being alone. I love uh, creating in my time, and so I'm either surfing or uh, or making music. Because I didn't know that about you. Um, I interviewed you a few years back um, for a written interview we did, and I wasn't aware that you were an interviewer. I mean, is that quite an unusual fact about yourself, or what would you... If somebody asked you for the strangest fact about yourself, what would you say to them? Oh, man, I don't even know. I don't even know what's strange anymore. You know, there was a time where I was basically hiding that I was into personal development and I loved all of this stuff. And now if you do a Google search for me, it's the thing that comes up. So I, I, everything's kind of upside down now. Who knows? And is that something- it, it ha- it'd have to be up to somebody else to figure out what's strange about <laughs> I'd dread to think what they would say about me. Uh- <laughs> And I noticed that you do a lot of surfing and there's pictures of you um, sort of 
I think it's paddle boarding or it might be surfing. Is that yeah. your favourite exercise just now, or have you gotten into the gym and things like that? Or I've never been a much of a gym guy. I like to be outdoors. I like to be moving around. Um, I you know in the winter time I will go. I'll do some yoga classes and I'll do some body weight stuff at home. But you know summertime comes around, I just stay in shape by surfing. Um, I don't know if it's the best way, but I've been able to stay in pretty good shape that way. And I typically kind of gear my fitness towards being healthy to surf. So if I'm feeling good in the water, I know I'm doing good. And if you have to say you've just moved to a new place, you're by yourself, you want to have somebody over for a dinner party. You have a choice of five people. They can be alive, dead from the entertainment world. Who do you pick to come over? Oh man, let's see. David Gilmour. Um, I'd probably just have a bunch of <laughs> musicians there the first time. So yeah, I'd love to talk to David Gilmore. I'd like to maybe Alex Lifeson from Rush. Um, let's see who else. I'd like to. I'd like to. Uh, who else? Oh my gosh! I wish you'd. you'd uh, this is where I go into overload. Like, oh man, who would I like to have there? Let's just start with those two guys. If it got more than five, more than two or three, I'd, I'd, I'd shut down. I don't know if I could talk to everybody. I'll we'll just do those two for now. It gets difficult, doesn't it? Your uh, bite. Jerry Lope, I tell you, the surfer Jerry Lopez. I've always wanted to hang out with him. Um, who else? Yeah, those are those are three weird guys right there. I'll start there. And are they on your bucket list of want to interview guests, or you know who who would you want on the podcast? Because you've interviewed some amazing people. You must be, you know, taking them off. Is it musicians? Is it surfers? Who else is on your dream interviews? Yeah, I think I think more and more is, is as I get older. I I don't I, the lines between personal development and creativity. Or I don't have a line between those two things. So when I when I read about artists, um, I, I I see the parallel between that and what I do as a coach. You know, so. I, you know, for me, having those people in the room and learning from them, I, I love to to hear about that. You know, there was something on YouTube. There were these ads for these master classes from these different like screenwriters and film scores like Hans Zimmer or something. And I, and I, I was drawn to that immediately. I was like, oh, I bet there's something about how Hans Zimmer approaches a film score that would help me be a better coach. Um, so I, that to me, I just love those overlaps. I love those parallels between the creative process and and then helping people create transformation in their lives. Because at the end of the day, like when people show up on the phone or when I'm talking, I have no idea what's going to happen that day. And the same thing's true as a creative person. You really don't know what's going to get created that day, but something's going to get created. It might be shit and it might be, might be great, but you're going to, you're going to do the work anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting topic you brought up because that was something when I first started, I had the same kind of people, the same kind of guests written out and, I just found that as I just went to anything of interest and went, oh, I will speak to that person. I want to find out a bit more about that. And it doesn't matter how out of your normal sphere of the world it is. You can learn something from anybody. You know, you can, the way they approach something, the way they do something can really help you in your own life. And it's just accepting and allowing yourself to, you know, view these kind of materials and be open to the message that they're portraying because you can learn something from anybody. Um, mm. Who has surprised you the most that you've interviewed? Has there somebody that you thought maybe wasn't going to be a good interview and has blown you away with their message? Oh, I don't know if I would have signed somebody up for a bad interview, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised that way. There have been people, I won't name names, but there have been people that I've interviewed that I thought would be a good interview. And they, I think they, you know, I think they're just used to talking. Like people put them on a stage and they talk. So there wasn't an interview. It was just, they, there was like somebody just wound them up and they talked. <laughs> so there wasn't much of a of back and forth like we're having today. So uh, that's always disappointing. That's kind of a bummer. It's like, oh man, I really wanted to have a conversation i try to interrupt and but they they're, they're so used to just regurgitating information that there there wasn't actual connection there wasn't a, any curiosity it wasn't i didn't feel like two human beings getting to know each other well that's what i was hoping i wasn't on that list you know i get this kind of when i started this i wanted it to be the an actual proper conversation to learn about the guest not just to have mm. the same sound bites that you hear on every single podcast 
Because mm. if I get into yeah. if I get into somebody, I want I Google them and I read thousands of their interviews and their watch all their videos and you see the same answer over and over and over. And I want to get to know the person, their fears, their hopes, their dreams. You know, I can go and read the sales page for their book if I'm wanting to hear the same thing over and over again. Right. And that's why right. I like your stuff is you get so deep into that person. You know, it's not just the same kind of sales pitches. You actually find out about the person. And, you know, it's like the one about the KKK with the, the black comedian. W. Kamal Bell, yeah. yeah. And then you're jumping to... Um, what was the one I listened to? It was about the mindset, the growth mindset, you know, and it's you you have such a wide range of people that are on it, and it was just I, I was blown away by the quality and the in depth and the yeah. So I mean, when something I liked when I was younger was looking at films and picking role models of people that I wanted to be like. So I used to pretend mm. I was like Wolverine or the Terminator or you know how I'd be in the situation. <laughs> I can remember right. my first typing job, I was getting bored, so I pretended I was Jack Black typing in, like, you know, trying to get the the details in by the end of the day. Right. Stuff just didn't... And I found the more I pretended to be like them, the more it actually kind of gave me that confidence and stuff. Uh-huh. So who do you look to as your role models from the entertainment world? You know, was there film characters or is there people now that you look to as a role model, for like friends and family? I don't know that the the role model stuff. There, there's been times. There've been like teachers in my life. There've been whether they knew they were teachers or not, but there were, there were, there were mentors or, um, gosh, you know, I had like a Tai Chi teacher I had uh, at one point. But I remember I would get into certain situations and I'd be like, man, what do I, I don't know what to do here? And I and I would just ask myself, well, what would this guy do? And the, the reality is, I don't know what that guy would do. I really don't. But what I found was like like what you just described is that it helped me access a, a different part of myself, and it was still me, but I I just gotten out of my own little box, and I was able it helped me to be more creative. So um, it wasn't so much like oh I need to what do I do so I'm like this person. It just I always liked that question and just kind of helped me pull pull my head out of my butt and see some other opportunities that don't normally show up if I'm playing defense, right? Like, well, how do I make sure I don't look stupid? How do I make sure I don't lose something? Um, I found that, that that helped me see other opportunities and just drop stuff. Um, yeah, it helps to get over ourselves. I just find we're far, far, I'm far more powerful when I get over myself. Not easy, but uh, <laughs> far more powerful. And what's your biggest regret and what did it teach you? Mm, I don't regret. I would say that there's a thread, and I don't. It's not any one particular thing, but there's a thing where I can um, not not be curious, and 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 it's rooted in being defensive. There's a thing like I don't want to I don't want to find out if I'm getting it wrong, or I don't want to find out if I'm, um, you know, not doing it well. There's there's a there's a thing there where I'm taking myself seriously, where I'm afraid of of looking bad to myself. And so it keeps me from actually going out and getting information and learning how to do something properly. So I can get my head up my ass and, and just want to kind of learn it on my own instead of getting help. So I, I, I think that's at the, there, there are things in my life where I look at, like I reached out for help this morning. I, I'm looking for help with a particular thing in my business. And so it's just normal for me. Like, Oh, I, I want to learn how to do that. So I can just kind of crawl down that wormhole on my own. But there's a thing I'm like, I don't really want to get good at that thing. That's something I would want somebody else to help me with. So why don't I go, go find somebody? Um, so, and I run, in, I run into this with a lot of entrepreneurs and stuff where we just, it's really challenging to get help, to recognize, hey, this is an opportunity to be helped and then to get help. So there's something in there about the curiosity piece, but then also opening up myself to be helped. I'm, I'm always there to help other people. That's, it's, it's far more challenging to be the person that helps me. And, and if there's a regret that I have, it's, it's, uh, you know, about loosening that up a bit so I can be helped more. Oh, so it's actually allowing yourself to be vulnerable and letting others come in to assist rather than doing it all. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to admit that we do need help. Um, and for people who are listening, I mean, you've made some amazing points and there's definitely people who are going to be interested in finding out more about you. 
where would you like them to check out? Is there a particular interview series that you'd recommend? Is it your YouTube channel? How can people find out more about you? Yeah. All the best stuff. There's just a ton of free stuff if you go to the new man podcast dot com. There, there's you're going to find the videos, you're going to find all the interviews that I've done, and then you can also find the the ebooks and audio books that I have available there. It's all it's all in one spot. So that would that's where I would tell people to go is the new man podcast dot com. Well, I'm definitely going to include some of my favorite ones on the URL oh, cool. the interview. Um, so we're coming up to the last two questions. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I've always been a fan. I've been a fan for years now. You know, you've helped me. Um, you've cheered me up. You've helped me through some mm. difficult times. Some of your podcasts, and you know, I've, I will remain a big fan. So, for anybody listening right now, what would you like them to do? Is there just uh, take, take action, or yeah, just follow your curiosity? That, that's the, I just find like, where do I can I give? Do I have the guts to follow my curiosity? Most of us don't. Most of us don't allow ourselves. We're distracted. We allow ourselves to get distracted by things, but very rarely do we do we allow ourselves to just go find our curiosity and nurture it. Especially if we don't see how that particular thing is going to make us money or get us laid or help us do this or do that. There's always like this um, qualifier, like well, it's got to it's got to be this or that before I invest more time and energy in it. And a lot of times we just don't give ourselves permission to do the thing that has us feel alive. And I think that sucks because there's, you, know, you don't have to walk around too far to, to, to bump into a lot of people that just aren't alive, that aren't enjoying their life. They don't give themselves permission to go do that thing that has them feel alive, has them feel energized, has them feel strong. So I love spending my time around people that are energized and, and engaged and strong. And so that would be my desire. I want to spend more time with people like that because it fires me up too. So, um, yeah, give yourself permission to do that. That's my request. That's great. And so the final question is always, um, the floor is open to you. Is there, you know, have you, are you working on a particular product that you'd like to recommend to people? Have you got a project coming up or like a webinar or anything like that? Um, I've been working on music a lot lately. I've just been diving in and doing music again, which is part of that thing. Like, oh, this isn't going to help my career. It's not going to help my family. It takes t- time away from my family. So uh, I've kind of taken my own medicine with that, but I've also really been enjoying after being a coach for over, you know, almost 12 years now, I'm enjoying helping other coaches. Uh, there's, there's a lot to this coaching business, which you won't learn in a book. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that want to, you know, have you think that if you just take a certification that you can become a powerful coach and it's just not true either. So I'm having a lot of fun you know, stepping outside of coaching people to also help other coaches. I want to be a force multiplier. I, I I love seeing how the people that I help are out there helping even more people. I love seeing that ripple. And that's where I'm getting lit up more and more these days. So whether they're coaches or whatever, they're in some kind of profession where they're directly impacting other people. I love working with those folks. That sounds good. And is there anything else you'd like to say? Oh, well, I just want to appreciate you. This has been a lot of fun, and I've, I've, uh, it's it's great to feel your genuine curiosity. There's a lot of people out there with these podcasts these days that, that kind of have the same 10 questions that they ask, and it's a bummer to do those shows. So I, I appreciate you. It's obvious that you did your homework and you and you prepared for this, and um, yeah, it's, it's a treat to do these types of interviews. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, um, I've been a big fan for ages, like I mentioned, and it's been an honor to speak to you again. I'd, I'd love to have you on the show again sometime in the future if, if you're if you're willing um, sounds good well that's it for another week thanks for listening absorb it practice it use it until next time keep trying to hit that next level in your life <laughs>